All right, officially, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Just before we start tonight, I want to give you the homework for next time, so I won't forget it. You should have found a sheet there uh, on the issue of the hierarchical relation of the ideas in objectivism. There's, I believe, 20 different statements or topics deliberately in an utterly random, senseless order. And uh, what all I want you to do next time is number them logically from 1 to 20. The more fundamental, the more primary, the smaller the number. The absolute first item of knowledge would have to be 1, and the last, the thing that depends on every blessed other one on that list, would have to be 20. And then you can arrange it in order. There are options. There are certain cases where you have a choice, which is one of the significant things in this exercise, uh, which we want to point out in contrasting objectivism to rationalism. But there's not all options which contrasts objectivism to empiricism. So do what you can. Now, I made this, I may say, I hope you won't think insultingly easy, but relatively easy. I left out a lot of tricky ones, and after we go through the, the order of this 20 next time, I'm going to throw them at you one new one at a time, and you tell me, would it go between 4 and 5, or 9 and 10, or whatever? Where would it go? And we'll get more and more tricky uh, as we go, until hopefully you will have a real sense of the hierarchical structure. So start on this. We'll start taking that up next time. Now, this evening, we are going to continue what we've been doing, digesting objectivism. Our topics, however, are not uh, life as the standard and not honesty, but force and then rights, if we can get both of those topics in tonight. We have two people that are going to chew force, the evil of the initiation of force, and then one who is going to do the topic of validating individual rights. Now, these are real people tonight. That is to say, I did not write their part. I have no idea what they're going to say. They are going to do their conscientious best to recreate their mental processes when they try to understand these topics. So we will have the virtue tonight of reality as opposed to these artificial, carefully stylized presentations. But unfortunately, probably, if experience holds true tonight, we will have the vice of chaos. Uh, I have a hand raised at the back? Oh. Um, so I'll have to ask you to bear with us. If it gets very chaotic, we will try to sort it out at a certain point. And at the end, I will summarize my understanding of the topics so as theoretically add some clarification. Perhaps that's unnecessary if the volunteers do it. In any event, try to listen intently, but listen primarily now methodologically. In other words, what steps are they using? Do you approve of the process? Are they omitting some crucial thing or what? Don't just listen from the point of view of do you agree or disagree with their view of force and rights. This is primarily, again, an exercise in how to understand. Of course, we have to actually understand something to get the methodology, but our focus is on methodology. Now, I will ask you at appropriate points to comment on, give me your impressions, but uh, I would like to caution in advance, and this is addressed as much to myself as to you, that you should be as temperate and kind as you possibly can be in formulating any comments, because the people in question are doing a very difficult thing. They're standing up before hundreds of people uh, who they know are waiting to pounce on every phrase they utter. And that takes a tremendous amount of courage. They're not professional philosophers, and even a professional philosopher would be daunted uh, by that type of assignment. So they are only to be praised for what they're doing. And any comments, even if you think they really mess up the assignment, should be made in a friendly and, if possible, supportive way. And I'm saying that to name the general rule to you and to myself so that it won't be too traumatic for them. Now, just to pave the way, well, maybe that's an unfortunate 
way of putting it. I want to start by doing something wrong, uh, which I sometimes get, for instance, we're starting on the topic of the evil of the initiation of physical force. And uh, I'd like you to tell me, just in essence, what is wrong with this as a chewing the topic of the evil of force. Now, in the seminar, this was actually what we got uh, one evening on this topic, and I think it reveals a type of error that we've covered already several times, but it's worth hammering at home again. So bear with me for a minute. What's wrong with this? Presented now as an inner process of chewing the topic of the evil of the initiation of force. And I'll give it just in effect as it came out in the seminar. Well, we have to start with existence exists. Uh, existence has identity. Consciousness is the faculty for perceiving it. Since everything is something, man must be man. That means he requires a specific course of action to survive. And that course involves he has to think and then work to achieve the values his life is uh, requires. Thinking is not automatic. It's uh, volitional. So therefore, he is not born with any automatic course of action. He has to choose the right alternative course, and that is the purpose of ethics, which is a code of values to guide human choices and action. And rights are guides indicating what man's essential relation to others in society should be. Force is the only way to violate men's rights. And therefore, the threat of force really destroys man's means of survival. It really defies reality. Force negates the law of identity, because it doesn't let man live by his nature. And it negates the law of causality, because it doesn't let man keep the results of his effort. Therefore, the initiation of force is evil. Now, that, now let me just say there is nothing I said that's wrong in that whole process. But if you go through that, you do not have understanding of the topic of force at the end. Now, what is wrong? I saw a hand there, a red hand, yes. You brought up the subject of rights before you had established rights. Well, you say I brought up the subject of rights before I established rights. I brought up an awful lot of subjects uh, before I uh, established them. Rights isn't the only one. So maybe we could say a little more. Marianne, yes. Well, it's a kind of summary. Louder. It's a summary, or like a summary, of the whole phase leading up to that subject. And it's almost like a listing of objectivist aphorisms. Correct. Well, that's a little hostile when you say a listing of objectivist aphorisms. But you're correct. This is a summary of objectivism. That is not chewing the topic of force. That is as much time given to the metaphysical base the ethics, et cetera, as is given to the topic of force. In this, in this presentation, force was a couple of sentences at the end, and metaphysics was a couple of sentences at the beginning, and ethics was a couple of sentences at the, in the middle. Now, this is not what we're after, and that's what I want to uh, uh, stress here. We do want to quickly scan the context on which the idea we're focusing on depends. But our goal is not to recapitulate that context, not to give a whole song and dance of the whole thing uh, from the beginning. Otherwise, we violate the purpose of the assignment and the Crow epistemology. When we set the context, we don't want to start with existence, God help us, and work step by step all the way down, because our mind will be blown by the time we get where we're focused on. We want to pick a few high points, and the operative word is few, as a reminder of what we already know, an orienter of what we can take for granted, and then focus all our attention on the one topic that really we are trying to understand, namely, the evil of the initiation of force. Chew that in detail. So there should be a tremendous difference between the hit-and-run reminder of the context, which you are not here chewing or trying to understand. You're just reminding yourself of in a few little words. And then the detailed, intense focus on one idea which you're trying to uh, understand. 
Now we know as far as the context is concerned here that we're way past metaphysics and epistemology, so we take for granted reason and reality. We know we're way past the beginning of ethics, so we take for granted already life is the standard and rationality uh, is the basic virtue. We're way past all that. So it's almost unnecessary. If you want a quick reminder, you could say something like reason, reality, life, rationality, but it's too much already. We're way down. It's like we're now on at least 35, 38, 40th story of this 50-story building, so we don't even want one proposition for every 10 stories. Just pull out the few that will orient us to the topic uh, that we're going to. What are they that we're going to hear? Uh, as a matter of fact, that we're going to hear now from the first volunteer. But just before that, let me tell you a checklist. If you want to take this down quickly, this is nothing new, but this is the checklist that I am using to listen to these presentations, to see, to check them methodologically. These are all points we've already covered, and I think the volunteer should not listen, because if I heard somebody list this many things they were going to listen for, I'd be completely paralyzed. <laughs> and and I, have it, I have it on the sheet just in this phrase, not in whole sentences, but just in a few words. Right conclusion. Is it the right conclusion? Context-hierarchy. Have they set the right context hierarchically? In other words, in the right order. Three. All I have is definitions-oscillate. In other words, are they defining whatever is absolutely essential, and are they keeping that tied to reality by reducing it to the concretes? And then right next to that, concretized. And right next to that, inductive, as opposed to that rationalistic deduction. And then the next, stages, is it, if necessary, is the argument broken up into steps? Devil's advocate, uh, there's some objections. If the person is blithely passing by that are blatant. And then, integration. <clears throat> that basically is what we're looking for. Now, not every point will be equally applicable to every topic, but in one form or another, uh, they will all uh, come up, and that's just might be a help to scan. But with that, I'm going to now introduce our first heroic volunteer, Freddie Shore. And you got the mic on? All right. You want to come up then? with the understanding that I might possibly interrupt you or not, depending upon how it goes. So just take your time to get organized. Put your notes out if you have any. Do you want water? Yes. Let's begin with these premises kept in mind and limited to these. Number one, metaphysically, A is A. We know that. Reality is what it is, but specifically, Reality for man, for anything in this world, in this universe, is not determined but yeah. reality is not determined by arbitrary any kind of social convention. Secondly, man specifically to survive must be free to use his mind. He must depend upon his mind for survival. And third, the standard of what man ought to do in life is his life, what advances his life as a fully rational human being. Now consider three examples, a couple of them historical. One, Adolf Hitler announces that he's going to take over as much of the world as possible. And in each instance, when his armies march into another country, he is ready with a pretext that he's only acting in self-defense of the German people. Second example would be, um, in 1967, the state of Israel, anticipating by means of uh, military intelligence that they were about to be attacked on all sides, attacked first. 
and blew up the opposing air forces and claimed that they did that in self-defense. And my third example would be a man, an individual, in a car, um, who is stop, stopping at a red light and is confronted by two or three hoodlums who are menacing him with gestures amounting to pay or die, and doing what he thinks best, running one of them over and heading for the nearest police station. Now, I would say that if you take all those examples together, you can work out inductively a definition, a workable definition of what, why, of what force is and why it's evil. I would say that force is either the use of physical compulsion or willful deception to achieve an end, to acquire a value from other people that one could not or would not otherwise acquire. In other words, you take or compel them or convince them to give you something that they would not give of their own free will if they knew what they were doing. Why is such an action wrong? From the standpoint of the individual aggressor, in order to achieve whatever it is he or she has in mind to achieve, whether it's the acquisition of territory or a material good, a diamond ring, or anything else, they have determined that they can't achieve these values on their own, can't or won't. And therefore, they're going to take it from someone else. In order to take something from someone else, you must do two things mentally. You must obliterate your awareness of what it means to be a human being as far as their being a human being is concerned, and you must obliterate your own conception of yourself as a human being. You have to look at yourself, in other words, as a gun. If you're willing to do that, that means you are contradicting the basic needs of your own life from the start. Therefore, it's not surprising, in fact, it's, it follows logically, that you will violate other people's existence as human beings. This, by definition and by direct observation, practically, is anti-life. What comes to mind, the two uh, problems that I need to answer for myself are when, at what point is a person provoked to violence by the actions, the, the overt physical force or the threat of physical force of other people, at what point is that, if the person defends himself or herself, is that really self-defense, even if he or she acts first, as in the case of Israel? Secondly, or for that matter, in the case of the individual who I described in the car who runs over a prospective uh, mugger or a robber. Now, in reality, a court of law might find that person guilty of excessive use of force, <laughs> given the nature of the law and the way it is. But in fact, if a person acted, if their motivation was to defend their life against someone who, by his or her actions, refuse to recognize what it means to have a life, specifically a human life or any life, then the person acted rationally. The person who, did, who was willing to use force, from the instant that they conceived the action, were in a state of irrationality and were, if, and were acting against life as soon as they uh, carried that thought into effect, into action. Now, in practice, an entire community, a nation, can act on that premise, okay? that their needs are such that they must take something by force. Okay? If that premise is acted upon by a sufficient number of people, you have a state of anarchy and brute terror. Okay? And it is no more possible to have a community of nations that are not self-destructing 
on that premise, then it is possible to have a group, small group of people in a small community operating on that premise, or for that matter, to even be Robinson Crusoe on an island by yourself and learning cooperation with Man Friday. Doesn't, the numbers don't matter. The premise is the same. OK. Thank you very much. OK. <clears throat> Thank you. A lot of good effects. Now, that's very excellent to get us started here. <clears throat> because it is a mixture of good things and certain things which are not completely adequate. Uh, and I would like to try to, I don't want to drag this out in infinity, but I don't want to just immediately give you a quick lecture on the notes I took. What was good about this? Take any aspect that was good, because there were things that are definitely worth uh, uh, commenting on uh, here that were good and that represent the right process and a clear understanding uh, in content. All right, yes. Any one thing? Yes. Well, the examples you picked seem to imply a devil's advocate uh, uh, problem. It's the, I mean, he picked. Wow. Uh, he, he picked examples that, that implied a devil's advocate problem just in the example. You say he picked examples that imply a devil's advocate problem. So he covered two uh, birds with one stone. Is that it? How, how did that, how did he do that? Well, if the initiation of force is wrong, then why is it all okay to initiate force against someone who's going to mug you? Well, I have to respectfully disagree with you. I think that's a problem uh, with uh, the presentation, because what is the purpose of, a, uh, of examples? The purpose of examples, when you're trying to understand is to try to make it as clearly tied to reality as possible. The purpose of the examples is to connect your broad abstractions to clear-cut instances. In this case, uh, the issue of interjecting, when is self-defense excessive force, mixes a very difficult question of detailed application within a governmental legal system with the broad topic that we're trying to discuss. So it's out of hierarchical order. I'm sorry, Freddie, to start with, I meant to start by building up a whole bunch of positives, but he undercut me. But you see, if your goal is, why is force evil? You, that is a great big general topic. First, you would have to address yourself to that. You would have to choose your examples, your arguments, etc., all from the point of view of understanding that, while knowing once I've established that, there's still a tremendous amount of detailed application of it. For instance, the initiation of force, OK, I get that versus self-defense, but what about borderline cases where it's self-defense, but there's too much force? That is already a question of detail way late in the game that you cannot inject back into the topic what is, why is force as such evil? That would be exactly like on the topic of honesty. Our basic question was, why should you be honest? Now, if somebody then took one of those really tricky questions, you know, like, I'm up against a government bureaucrat, and my partner doesn't know, and started with that as an example, it would constantly deflect his thinking from the essence of the issue to one very specialized application. So the, the rule here is do not pick controversial concretes. Pick a nice range of concretes that when you're trying to understand, they should be simple, straightforward, until they really nail down the topic. Then when you grasp it, you can do as a separate assignment. Now I'm going to get a trickier case where there's a number of things intersecting and see how I apply. So it is not a good idea to combine concretizing with the uh, devil's advocate. Uh, on the contrary, uh, it's a bad idea. I learned this originally teaching elementary logic. And I thought I'd get you know, two birds for the price of one. And in illustrating a, various, a certain fallacy, which is a simple fallacy to understand, I threw in an argument for isolationism, you know, uh, politically speaking. This is many years ago. 
Uh, and uh, the example aroused the class, and they became so controversial that they began to challenge the logical point involved because they disagreed with the political issue. And I lost the entire thing on the example. And I learned from that, examples cannot be controversial. They have to be illuminating. Only after that's hammered down can you then go to tricky or complicated things. But let us say that there was a very good thing here, and that is the fact of examples. Now, I was happy that he did not start by saying something like this. Rationality is the exercise and so on. Force is the so-and-so, and therefore, you know, that rationalistic model of deduction from definitions, because so this was certainly not a rationalistic uh, presentation. He started with some examples, leaving aside of uh, one of them, the Israel one, was inappropriate for what reasons we've just mentioned. But a Hitler is certainly a good example on the topic of force. And a hoodlums pointing a gun and saying, pay or die, is a perfectly good example. Those are clear cut. Those are two nice examples. And if we're talking about force, those are just the kind of examples a nice homey one that would happen on Madison Avenue, you know, and then a world scale one. I mean, if we only had two, those are good. So he, he had, in his intention, a concretized and inductive uh, approach. So I give him a virtue in his intention to that extent, and one problem in implementation. Now, uh, what other comments uh, do you have uh, positive? It's hard to say, because you'll probably again say something in reverse. But what would you say, positive or negative? I don't care. Yes? I can't hear you. Stages were clear. You'll say the stages were clear. Well, the stages of what? The presentation started off. Not loud. presentation Well, his presentation, he's a good speaker. That's not the same point. He's a good speaker. He was clear. You knew what he was doing at each point. But stages, I'm doing it to you again, Faye. I'm sorry. <laughs> stages, as I use it, means stages in the argument. In other words, where you can say, his first point is this, and that leads of necessity to the second point, which is this, and that leads to the conclusion, which is this. In other words, a certain structured development of the argument. And he had an intention, but I, don't, I did not see that that was fully yet developed here. So don't confuse the fact that he was organized in his presentation. Now, he didn't just get up and say, here's an example, and that reminds me of my mother, and so on. He had a definite <laughs> logic, but that's not the same thing as saying that he exhibited the essential points that we need to understand this, and that's what I'm saving stages for. So I'll leave that in abeyance for the moment. Who else? Now, these comments are helpful, should be helpful to you to see what you get. At the back, I vaguely see a hand. Force being anti-life, I think that was a very good uh, point, and I think uh, you could elaborate on that. You think which? You could elaborate or break that down. Yeah, you certainly could. It was very important to say that force is anti-life. I mean, after all, the whole ethics rests on life as the standard. So ultimately, everything has to be validated by being either for or against life. That has to be the ultimate pay. So that was good as an intention. But now you add it, he could elaborate that. Well, now, that brings us, well, I'll leave that for a minute. He could elaborate that. But how, why should he? Why wouldn't it be enough to say, we know life is the standard. He said, if I remember correctly, force, and I'll, Freddie, forgive me if I misquote you, but I couldn't take actual shorthand. But in effect, you said, if you use force on uh, someone that obliterates the humanity of the victim and of you yourself, and that therefore, in effect, it's a twofold assault on life that it contradicts your own requirements, your requirements being presumably your point about you depend on the mind for survival. Is that the point you had in mind? So you're saying, in effect, it's like anti, it's against their mind, and it's against your mind. And 
uh, therefore it's anti-life. Right? Can we summarize it fairly that way? All right. All right, now take this just as a statement, because this is good and yet inadequate. At, simply in terms of expressing your own understanding. Now let's just, let me give you that argument again, and just consider this now as the argument against force. Man has to survive by his mind. Force obliterates the mind, both of the victim and of the perpetrator. Therefore, force is anti-mind, therefore anti-life. Now that argument has stages. It's clear-cut. It starts with the right idea, and in fact, the essence of that argument is correct. And that is basically what Freddie did say. But there is something inadequate with that argument. That does not represent understanding. Now, what is, what is inadequate about that? Now, mind you, we're assuming here that we can take for granted that man depends on the mind for survival, that life is the standard, that rationality is the supreme virtue. I'm not criticizing him for not elaborating any of that. But now he wants to understand why force is evil. He says, well, force repudiates all this. It's anti-mind, therefore anti-life. And he illustrated, look what Hitler did. So what's wrong with that? I mean, it's true. What, what's the problem? Uh, on the aisle at the back. I have to show that the force interferes between the man's perception of reality and his actions. And what's the you say he has to show that force interferes with man's perception of reality, or in other words, with his reason, with his mind. Well, he said that. He said force obliterates your, hu your human means of survival. So what else is required? Now, something is required. Well, look, let's try it. I know there's a lot of hands up, but I'm trying to zero in on the point. Let's try this from the devil's advocate point of view. We don't know anything about objectivism. And uh, somebody comes in and says, force, the initiation of force on someone is evil because it obliterates or destroys their mind and your own. Now, on a common sense level, what would be the obvious objection to that? I, there are many obvious cases where that does not seem to apply if you take it in the way it was stated. How many times have people been mugged, they still have the same IQ after as they had before, their minds are not obliterated? I mean, they were the victim of force. I mean, it could even be brutal force, rape, and who knows what. And they do not suddenly, now, it, it, it was, as it was presented, if I take it just straight, without filling in anything that I know on my own, it's as though force is like a lobotomy. Once you use force on someone, that castrates him, it obliterates his mind, he's finished. But how? Why? I mean, if it's a torture chamber and you're shooting electricity through his brain, that type of force would do it. But in the ordinary course of affairs, the guy does something he doesn't want to do. How is, does he lose his mind, or how does the perpetrator lose his mind, for that matter? So it comes down to this question. The thing that was omitted in this presentation is the central argument connecting force to rationality. In other words, it was simply taken for granted that the evil of force is that it attacks the mind, that it assaults reason. Then there were examples, definitions, context, and so on. But the main thing we want to do in chewing it is chew the connection to the context. In other words, we need a context. But then we want to see 
with, through a microscope, how does this particular idea connect to that context? It's not enough simply to say, we already know that rationality is essential for survival. Now, the thing that's wrong with force is that it's against rationality. How is it against it? Why is it against it? In what way is it against it? What is it about the nature of force and the nature of rationality that are inherently opposed? You see? And to be able to do that against a background of examples so that it's still uh, inductive, that would be the crucial thing. And that is what Freddie, to be sure, hinted at and intimated at, but did not actually hit the essence of what the uh, uh, understanding of it would consist of. So, he basically set the appropriate context. I don't think it would be necessary to say A is A there, because I just take for granted reality. Uh, we're way late in social ethics now, so I don't see that much is gained. You want, yes? Well, what I wanted to tie down there was the idea that it's not a question of social convention. You um, want to make the point that it's not an issue of social convention that force is objectively wrong. But it's too late at this stage of the game to make that point. In other words, by the time you get to force, you have to have established there is a reality, knowledge is objective, truth is not a matter of convention, that's all taken for granted. And then there's an objective standard of value and ethics, etc. By the time you get here, if you still have in the back of your mind, there's people out there who are subjectivists. So the first thing I want to say is, this is not a question to be decided by social convention. You already lost the hierarchy, because if you're still worried about those people, you're on a different topic. By now, it should be just yourself in your own mind that we've taken for granted all of metaphysics and epistemology, and the whole basis of ethics. We're way up, you know, so your context was like you looked at a few of the earlier stories that are relevant, and then you jumped way down to the first floor to make sure that no pickpockets got in. <laughs> but that's a different assignment, you see. All right. So there were good things about this, but we are still need a certain and further aspect. And now I'm going to ask one other person, uh, namely Phil Coates, to come up and do the same assignment as though uh, from scratch. OK, I'm going to st start by stating the context that I'm taking for granted here. Uh, basically, all of metaphysics and epistemology um, that uh, life is the standard, and um, that in a way I'm taking for granted that reason is man's means of survival. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute because I'm not fully taking that for granted. Um, also, egoism, that man is an end in himself, and that uh, man must live by principle, what we discussed last week. Uh, my proof, however, is going to sort of chew one of the things I said I was taking for granted, which is that reason is man's means of survival. Uh, basically, I'm going to discuss in, in what way and how that is true. Uh, what does it mean for man to survive by reason in, in some detail? Um, now, first of all, we're talking about the, the, the purpose of this discussion is to prove that the initiation of physical force is wrong. So briefly, to review the definitions of some terms, um, force uh, involves, some examples would be somebody robs somebody else, uh, commits fraud, obtains something from him by fraud, some material value, kills him, or threatens to do something to him, such as if he doesn't register for the draft, they're going to put him in jail. In all those cases, what you're doing is you're um, interfering, you're, you're taking a value from him without his consent. You're uh, interposing yourself between um, his reason and its acting to achieve some value. Um, so far, when I said I was taking for granted that reason is man's means of survival, I mean it that what I'm taking so far as established is uh, reason is a, a tool of human survival as opposed to the way um, animals survive. Uh, man does not survive automatically. He uses reason to identify, it's the process of identifying the evidence of his senses, um, the things that he sees out there in reality, forming concepts, 
drawing principles, drawing conclusions, and acting on that basis to pursue his survival. Um, now I'm going to go into uh, the proof. First of all, uh, we can consider a man whom force is initiated against, and uh, what can happen to him in those cases is that he, he loses something. He loses his life, his values, um, his reason is prevented from, from acting to um, achieve what he considers to, to be his, his survival. So I think it's, it's pretty clear cut, the examples that I discussed, robbery, fraud, killing, and so on, that these things all are opposed to his, his survival. The problem comes up more, but I, I did want to establish that, that um, the person who forces initiated against um, it's acting against his survival. Um, the, the more difficult area is the initiator. If the person who's initiated against loses something, um, doesn't the, per the initiator gain something? And if so, why is force destructive to his survival and his pursuit of values? Um, I'm going to start with an extended example and I'm going to then try and, and draw some conclusions. Sort of, the example is, is somebody's life and sort of how he uses reason to pursue his values in the course of his life. Um, take somebody who uh, ends up pursuing the, the career of an engineer. Um, let's just sort of follow his, his lifespan and see how he uses reason throughout it. Well, when he's a baby, we see him trying to learn, trying to learn about reality. He first has to work on the perceptual level, and then he has to eventually learn to um, focus and to walk and things like this. And at a certain point, he, he forms his first concepts. One thing we notice is that he's enjoying the process of, of using his mind. Later on, um, this, this child gets into school, and he goes to college. At some point, he decides he um, wants to be an engineer. And that's a, a long-range goal that he has to have. And he, he realizes that it is not done in one step. He has to build his knowledge. And he has to um, build that career um, step by step through the work he does, the choices he makes, uh, the abstract and practical knowledge he acquires. When he gets out of college, he then becomes a starting engineer. And again, he's also um, working for certain things in the future. He wants to get more interesting assignments, and, and so forth. So he's, he's working long range is, is, a, is a crucial concept here. Um, eventually, later in life, he becomes advanced in his field, whether it's engineering or whatever field it happens to be. Um, and he does that by building on his work and his knowledge and so forth. And by doing that, he builds tools that enable him to pursue wider values. He gets new knowledge, new assignments, uh, more practical benefits, a uh, better salary, um, things like that. What, what we see in this whole example of somebody pursuing through his, his life and, and using reason to produce, uh, he's being productive, to produce the, um, the values he needs for his survival, he, he builds up a... Um, by doing this successfully at each stage, he built up a certain self-confidence in himself with regard to reality. He learns that he's able, through these steps, to deal with reality and get, get more and more and get what, what he needs. Um, we see him operating long range. We see that to achieve the goals that he wants, to be an engineer, to have a better salary, uh, maybe to have a a bigger home later on. He's got to plan long range and he's got to build on his past. And he finds that as he does these things, his success is proportional to the above things, to his self-confidence, to his enjoyment, to his building, to his operating long range, um, and so forth. Um, now, suppose at a certain point in his life he decides to rob a bank. He decides for some reason that uh, money, there's so much money here and he could just reach out and grab it easily and it becomes an overriding value for him. Uh, what does this do to him? Um, 
I would maintain that it, it throws out a lot of these things that he's been building over time. It throws out his confidence. I mean, he has to, in some sense, not have confidence that he could have gotten as much money as he needed through not using force. Um, so this confidence that he built up, that he was capable of dealing with reality, is sort of thrown out um, by this, this action, by adopting a policy of force. Um, he throws out his independence. He's, he's implicitly saying, I no longer can independently, through my, my work, um, produce what, what I need. I have to get it by depending on somebody else to have produced it and then seizing it. Um, also, what he's doing by this act, either implicitly or explicitly, is he's subordinating, um, he's sub he's sub what, what he did in his, his life of choosing to be an engineer is he decided that uh, that was the career he would pursue. It was not necessarily one where he's going to, you don't normally become an, a millionaire by being an engineer. He decided that in his, his context, there, there are other things in almost any career that you could do which could make you more money. He decided that the material, the money itself, was subordinate to other things such as job satisfaction. He's now throwing that out. In a way, he's throwing out uh, the results of the work that he's done and the, the choices that he's made. Um, He's, he's throwing out his whole policy of step-by-step -step building and investing for the future in terms of, of money and, and work and so on. And he's throwing out the, the policy of cooperating with other men, that his, his relationship to other men is a cooperative one. Uh, instead, he's adopting an adversarial relationship. He's going to prey on them. Um, one thing that, that does to him psychologically is in the process of, of building up his, his self-confidence, and his skills, uh, he learned to, to uh, in this case, admire other men for having these qualities. And now he's got to sort of turn against that because their perceptiveness now becomes a threat. In other words, the, the virtues that he has built up and he's turning against become a threat to him when other men practice them. We just sort of speed up. Yeah, just tie it up. Now. Okay. You're giving us a lot to think. About. Okay. Okay. Um, he loses control of his life, he has fear, he throws out control of his life, he's not growing and building anymore, he's like on an animal level. Uh, he is living by feelings over principle because his principle was to go through his whole career and so on, and now he's saying in some cases if the bank is out there I'll just grab it. So he's violating the fact that he has to live by principle. Um, the materialism is his va of values, he's, he's taking values at a materialistic level. He's reducing himself down to saying money is the important thing. Um, and you can see this in people who initiate force. Uh, for example, a mafia hitman uh, is not somebody who you'll find at the ballet in the Metropolitan Museum. His pleasures are uh, drugs, gambling, casual sex, and fast cars. So he's reducing himself to the animal level. I'm almost through. Okay. I was going to say Hitler loved the Meisters. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are exceptions. Um, all right, so what I'm saying is force is evil because in actual practice to survive by reason means to build self-confidence, to grow, to live long range, to be independent, to have a cooperative relationship with other men, and not have values all be at a materialistic level. That's, that's it. The only thing that I want to say in conclusion is have I, have I you want to ask us to say, have we proven this? And I've, I think I've got some points, but they're all sort of floating together on the same level. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, we are extremely fortunate because that illustrates different points than the other, um, than Freddie did. And between them, we've got a tremendous demonstration. Now, that's really excellent. If you can name what's good and what's bad about that one, you're really in business as a digester. He did a lot of good things. And here I'm, I really mean that he did a lot of good things. Name some. Now, it should be clear cut what was good about this because there was a lot of good things in it. Yes, Andy. He was throughout focused on concretes, and they were 
a nice range of concretes, robbery, uh, murder, the draft. So there weren't too many. They included political, extreme, like, you know, uh, murder, lesser ones like crime against property, etc. Uh, it seemed to be clear in his mind what force was, and it, he was not at all some a very abstract definition deduced without example. So it was not floating, it was certainly not rationalistic. Uh, uh, what else was good about this? Yes? I think it was good that he pointed out that using force is a violation of living by principles. Well, he pointed out a lot of things. Why do you pick that out? He pointed out that Well, he said, using force is a violation of living by principle. He also said, using force, I, I couldn't take it all down, but was a violation of self-esteem in effect, or of self-confidence, that it was a violation of independence, that it contradicted the whole long-range issue of living a uh, long range, that it uh, put you on the animal level. I, I didn't, couldn't even take them all down, but that it contradicted the life of productiveness and achievement, uh, that it was the exact opposite of everything required to build up and uh, develop yourself from the time you were a child, etc. So he made a tremendous number of points about the relation of force to what? Now, to what? That's the point. That's the virtue and the problem of his presentation. And that's why he felt at the end that he could go on indefinitely that way, adding more and more, but somehow he hadn't nailed it to the wall, and yet he had a wealth of stuff, and it wasn't floating, so there's only one thing that he, that he didn't do right. But the key is, what is it that he focused on the relation of force to? Psychological well-being. No, not only psychological well-being. He included existential actions that the criminal was no longer independent in practice, that he was no longer productive. He didn't make it just, you know, this will curdle your soul if you use force. No, no, it wasn't that. Uh, yes? Rational living. What is the question? I forgot that you're answering. <laughs> <laughs> what is rational living an answer to? You asked, uh, what did this, uh, all of these examples and all of this that you well, mentioned? He, he took many different aspects of the objectivist ethics, all of them being various forms or expressions or applications of rationality, and showed that force would uh, conflict. He took each very briefly as an example, right, on the case of the engineer. And he said, you see this, what will it do to self-esteem, and what will it do to productiveness, and what will it do to independence, and what will it do to acting on principle, etc. Now what is exactly the name of that process, which is a very essential process, but that is the conclusion of understanding, that is not the essence of it. What is that process, what have we been calling that? Where you connect a topic to all the other things that it belongs connected with, and thereby cement all your knowledge together. What is that process? Integration. That is a very crucial thing, only the main flaw in this is that he took the topic of integration with the rest of his knowledge as the essence of understanding this one topic, when it's not. Integration here is the cherry on the cake. So he omitted, in essence, the same thing that the first speaker omitted. In other words, what is the essential principle of why force is wrong? To grasp it, you first have to grasp it as a principle. What is it about force that makes it wrong? Now sure, it's anti-reason. Why? You have to grasp it in principle, because if all you hold is, it's anti-reason because it's anti-independence, and it's anti-long-range, and it's anti-principles, it's like the crow epistemology. You cannot retain it all, and consequently, what you feel in your mind is, I got a whole bunch of arguments, like I have 23 arguments against force, but they're all sort of like each other. They don't gel into one insight, one clear grasp. This is force, and this is why it's wrong. 
Now what you properly want to do is first grasp in a non-rationalistic way what is, why is force wrong in principle? And then, if you stop there, of course that's no good, then you concretize and integrate with all the other aspects of the system. That way the principle gives you the direct essence of the issue to retain in your mind. And all the integration then is tied on one central trunk in your mind, and it doesn't just lie there like six or eight or twelve different arguments that you don't know what to do with. So, I would say he was good on examples, he was very good on integrating, but the integrating was premature. Instead of focusing on the essence of the evil of force, he touched on that, he hinted at it. But I, I, I listened to that and I thought, oh, if only he would stop here and give me a speech on this one sentence that he uttered. Really chew that one point till the principle is clear. Then he could go off onto concretes and integration with other points and there would be no problem. But that's what he didn't really do. So it's now up to me. His context was pretty good. We'll discuss that further. So he did have a lot of good things there. Now let me have a few minutes to give you the idea of how I would go about this. Now please don't take this as a criticism of the other two speakers because they did very well under these circumstances. They did not have it all written out uh, the way I do. And uh, uh, you know, they didn't have the advantage of this whole thing prepared. But this is how I would go about it, and you'll see that there are elements from the other presentation. But what I want to stress here is what I think was omitted that would be the, 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 the peg, the principle. I'd start to myself, well I know that according to objectivism, there's two fundamental ways of dealing with others, by reason or by force. I know that objectivism holds in some way force is anti-mind, anti-reason. Somehow it's destructive of the mind. But how or why, that is what I'm trying to understand. That much. Now it would not satisfy me to say because mind requires productivity and the mind requires self-esteem, because I'm changing to the subject from the mind in its essential functioning to some derivative or application. And I want to directly connect force with the essence of the mind if I want to really grasp this in principle. Well, then I would, the way I would, would do it, I can't really explain why I would do it. They say, well, this is what would occur to me. Imagine that things were different. I like to sometimes rewrite reality to change one thing because that helps to highlight the way things really are. So suppose that reality was different in one way. Let us suppose the wielder of force could actually change your mind by using force. Suppose a dictator had that power, like from the Twilight Zone, or a guy with a gun. For instance, you were an atheist, and if somebody pulled a gun on you and said, start believing in God or I'll shoot, you were able to do it. Suppose you could say, okay, after all, my life depends on obedience to this guy, so now I'm going to start believing in God. Now I would say, if you could do that, there's no argument against force. You just have a, a different conclusion, that's all. Then the only thing we'd have to ask is, if you're going to use force, try and do it on behalf of good ideas. <laughs> the fact is, and the crucial fact, that, that nobody brought out, but that's the essence of how the mind operates, and therefore they're going to lead us to the essence of why force is anti-mind, is that you cannot do it. You can, of course, say to him that you don't believe in God, uh, that you believe in God. But that's not the point. You cannot literally make your mind do it. And the key point here is, in this sense, your mind is out of your control. 
It will not obey an injunction to believe, not even if you know that your life depends on it. Now why not? Why can't a mind be compelled to accept a conclusion? Why not? Well, that takes us back to what the mind is. It's one thing only, and that is what? A cognitive faculty, a faculty for grasping knowledge, a faculty for perceiving reality. And if you know epistemology, you know it has to do this by a complex process of thought, evidence, coming to conclusions, etc. It has to observe facts, judge, connect, etc., etc., and the result is either knowledge or at least an honestly held conclusion, even if it's an error. But if a mind avowedly defies facts that are, up, uh, that are within its awareness, if it says in effect, forget reality, truth is irrelevant, the faculty literally cannot function. It's stopped dead. There's no way for the person within the confines of his own mind to proceed. And the crucial point is here. We are not saying it's bad to force a mind. Because to say it's bad would imply what? You can do it, but it's wicked. The fact is you cannot do it. Not in the sense of forcing it to come to an opposite conclusion to the evidence it itself sees. To try to force a mind to accept such a conclusion against its own judgment is like saying, accept what you know is not true. It's like saying, try to believe that red is green or two and two is five. And you can't make a man believe such a thing, George Orwell, to the contrary. You can drive him crazy, but you can make him believe it. If somebody says your money or your life, to take that homie example, you can give him the money. The gun will make you give him the money, but it won't make you believe that it's his money. And it cannot make you believe that. Not the mere act of the gun being held. So what then does the force forcer accomplish? He cannot force you to think a certain way. What is it that he does accomplish? Yes? He forces you to act a certain way. What way? Against your judgment. He doesn't change your mind. This is the essence of the situation. He makes it irrelevant, irrelevant. It is removed from life to the extent of force being uh, initiated against you. Your mind has nothing to say about your action. Since force cannot make you think differently, all it can do is rupture the tie between thought and action. In other words, it makes thought inoperative, inapplicable, pointless. It shunts the mind aside as irrelevant. Now, if we have a context established in which we have two things in our context, number one, neither of which we're supposed to be chewing here. We've already gone them, presumably, before we get here. Number one, man survives by the use of his mind. And number two, all ethical issues must be determined by principle, because man has to survive long range, and that's his only method, etc., that we discussed last time. If we have only those two established, and no more in our context, what are we entitled to conclude? If man survives by the use of his mind, and we have to decide issues in principle, and the essence of force is to make mind inapplicable to life, what inexorable conclusion do you have to come to? Force is, in principle, what? Anti-life. Has to be. Has to be evil in principle, because its essential function, by its nature and by the nature of the mind, is to remove the mind from any relevance to action. So it has to be evil. In its very essence, it is something aimed at man's means of survival, by the very nature of that means of survival. 
Now that is what I call an argument in principle. That's not enough. I haven't yet chewed it. I haven't concretized it. I haven't integrated it. But I have given a central peg, a central argument that is an argument that does establish in principle what the essential connection is between this point and my context. See. Now if we grasp this in principle, we do not have to say, what about the perpetrator? Now Phil said, and I've heard this time and again from people working with this issue, well it's easy to see that force is bad for the victim. It's, it's against his life. But I don't see why force is bad for the perpetrator. If I quoted you correctly, Phil, you said, I wrote that down and now I can't find it. Oh, I have the wrong page. Oh yes, you said it's more difficult to prove that force is evil for the perpetrator. This is absolutely not true. Now why not, just on the basis of the way uh, we've set it up so far? Why can't, why can't you say, well, we still have the problem of the perpetrator? Yes? If you grasp what it means to think in principles and that ethics is an issue of principle, you cannot say, I've established that this method is destructive of man's means of survival. Now, I know it's bad for some people, but why not for others? I know it's bad for the guy on one end of it, but why not for the guy on the other end? If man has to live by principle, and if he has to survive by his mind, that in itself is sufficient to establish just as much for the perpetrator as for the victim. He is violating the essential principle. So it comes down to this, is the context really clear in your mind? Do you grasp the necessity of functioning by principle, coupled with the necessity for rationality to be the principle? If you grasp those two, then as soon as you see that force is a violation of rationality, it's wiped out for everybody, the perpetrator or the victim. It's no more difficult for one than for the other. Now, this is just the beginning. I'm going to be briefer here. I have to concretize this because I am uh, so far talking in the clouds. Now, it's good to talk in the clouds, because otherwise you get lost in concrete. But you have to know that when you state a general argument like this, this is like a promissory note, like an IOU. And now it's called in for collection. And the, uh, the, the payment is the concretes. But the concretes have to be concretes illustrating this point. So if I go at this stage, too, it violates independence and it violates whatever, then I'm do talking about something different. I'm talking about the applications of rationality. Now I want actual concrete showing that force makes the mind irrelevant. That was my argument. I want to concretize that exact principle. Well, let's take the mugger. He says your money or your life. Well, how does that make your mind irrelevant? That's very simple. Does anybody know? Now, it doesn't make your mind irrelevant in every single question of your entire existence. But by the same token, the guy is not initiating force on every aspect of your entire existence. He's initiating one force, your money. So what question does he make your mind irrelevant or removed from? Yes? What should I do with my money? Your conclusion now is irrelevant. What you think has no effect. His gun, of course, doesn't change your mind, but it makes your mind inoperative in that issue. It's as simple as that. If his will is dictating what you're going to do, your thought is simply beside the point. Now, of course, if you live in a society where that man is recognized as morally wrong and the government is on your side, this is a very delimited interference with your uh, mental processes, because you're free to go on thinking and act accordingly as soon as he leaves the scene, and you're even free to go on planning how to spend the money when the police force recover it. On the assumption that the government hunts down the criminal because they believe that the initiation of force is evil. But if the government is on his side, 
If all of your money were expropriate, then you couldn't think about the material side of life at all. It would be completely beside the point. For instance, and here concretize, under complete socialism, where the government tells you everything that you can and can't do with material property. Well, what has to be built, how, where, when, etc., etc. Well, on all those issues, then, your conclusions are simply irrelevant. They're inapplicable. Thought is for one purpose, and that's for action, to guide value achievement. If the action is predictated, the thought is unmotivated and not possible. Of course, even under socialism, you can think what? How to escape. If you can do it, but Leo, for instance, and We the Living couldn't find any way and just gave up, quit thinking altogether. And or, even within socialism, you can think within the frame of the possibility of action. For instance, if they give you a toothbrush coupons and there's two colors to choose, red or green, you can decide which one you want. But the point is this, insofar as force applies, mind does not. That's the issue. Mind versus force. In principle, they are opposites. And if we wanted to take the time, you'd see there's a whole spectrum of degrees from mugging on, for instance, through the southern black slavery, which were very much under force. There was much less thought. They uh, were not, not much point for them to think about their values or goals. The slaves, they had more short-range despair goals. Um, a, a basically unthinking way of life because there was no possibility of doing anything with their thought. On through complete totalitarian socialism, where every action is controlled in principle, and the result is you see whole societies with no science, no invention, no art, no ingenuity, and starvation. A large-scale example of force across the board, that's the principle of the mugger across the board. And the result is the extirpation of thought across the board. Now, the utter extreme of this, if you want one more example, which to me is a very eloquent one, was the concentration camps. Now, the concentration camps is the only example, as you know I make the point in the ominous parallels, of absolutely consistent totalitarianism, where force rules every moment, and absolutely nothing is left to the discretion or judgment of the individual. Literally nothing so far as that's possible. And even to the point where people tried to prevent themselves from, perce from perceiving what was happening before their eyes unless the guard said to do so. And you know that the result of that was mass death in an unprecedented way in history. Mass zombies and mass death. That was the unavoidable result of this type of condition, except for those people who could project another way of life and could keep alive by remembering or anticipating a world in which they could act, they were able to keep themselves functioning to that extent by trying to think of a non-forced world. Now you see, the idea of concretizing would be, take it across the whole gamut. To the extent that force exists, it makes thought useless, slashes it off. If you go by principle, then you have to say it's uh, anathema. Now, a few last points just to finish off on force here. What then is the context? Essentially, well, reason, reality, we don't have to repeat. Life principles, rationality. Those are the main ones. But is that enough, even with the concretes that we've given? It's a partial. It's an argument in principle, and it's examples to show that that principle is not floating. But what have we still uh, omitted? We've omitted the complete richness of the argument all of the aspects that it encompasses, because rationality is not only the exercise of the mind to grasp truth, it's all the expressions of that, including independence and integrity 
and honesty and productiveness, etc. Now that we see the essential relation of force against rationality, it's at this point that what Phil did becomes crucial. Integration, which consists now of tying it point by point to all of the other topics uh, in the uh, ethics. I'm trying to cut out a lot of this material. Give me one second. Let me make one point here on the question of induction versus deduction. Let me ask you this question. Why couldn't I simply argue as false? Rationality requires the perception of reality. Force interferes with the perception, therefore force is anti-reason. Therefore, really, the whole thing is a strictly deductive argument. Why is that invalid? if that is the essence of what you have to say. Even though that is a key point. But why is it not enough? Why is that inadequate? Yes. Okay. Well, you have to know what you mean by each concept, and you have to be able to answer particular cases so you can deal with examples. Well, you have to be able to have formed these concepts to begin with. Now, how do you think, for instance, the concept of rationality is formed? You know, a person doesn't just sit down one day and say, let me see, I'm going to give a name to the use of the mind. I'm going to call that mentality or rationality or something, and go on from there. How would Ayn Rand have reached her concept of rationality? She would have to have observed a tremendous amount of actual instances of human behavior, and say, here is a person working, here is a person being a parasite, this one is using his mind, he isn't. Here is a person acting on his conclusions, and this one is a compromiser, so this one is following his mind, and this one is hypocritical and betraying. Here is a person holding a gun on somebody, uh, and therefore he's using force, not mind, and here is a person who's working independently, etc. In other words, she'd have to observe, and reality doesn't come in any order. It doesn't bring you on Tuesday or in January all the examples of honesty, and then on Wednesday or February all the examples of integrity, and then six months later all the ones of force. It's all mashed together. She would have to observe instances of force along with all the other instances of irrationality, in contrast to all the different forms of rationality, and then she would connect them all up and she would say, what is it that's common to all of these instances of force, dishonesty, etc., and so on, and she would form a concept of rationality. So in other words, she only reaches that fundamental concept by a long induction which requires her to be attentive to the actual facts, including the issue of the concrete examples of force. So first you observe reality, and you form your concepts, including the concept of rationality. That is an inductive process. In forming the concept, you are implicitly saying, this excludes criminality. That's the opposite of it. And then when you systematize it, you state the principle why. Now, if a person enters at that stage and merely hears the deductive arguments, it sounds like rationalism. But the whole point is to grasp that the operative concepts come from reality, and the theoretical argument is simply an organization of material once you originally get it from uh, reality. In other words, to put this point more simply, you have to observe all the evil effects of force, criminality, dictators. After all, Ayn Rand majored in history, and she did it for a reason. She wanted to know what was the actual result of certain principles in human life. And she found that wherever she looked, certain types of behavior led to disaster, and other types didn't. And she was able to grasp from that there is something wrong with force. And then she was simultaneously working on her idea what, how should man live, and then she connected the two. Force is anti-mind. But there was a preliminary period of simply gathering the observational data. In reality, it's all simultaneous. Our process has to be induction to reach essential concepts, 
and then deduction uh, therefrom. The more we go, the more we chew, the more we integrate, the higher on the spiral, the clearer we finally get. All right, I'm sorry, we went a little over long. Let's take a brief break and try one more topic after the break. Thank you. Now we're going to do one more topic tonight. Obviously, we cannot give it the detailed attention that we gave this other topic, but we'll at least give it a hit and run stab as one more example of the process. And that is the topic of the validation of individual rights. We're not yet saying what is the relation of that topic to the initiation of force. Hopefully, if time doesn't run out, we'll get to that. But we're just taking this topic by itself, and our volunteer is Donna Lowry. So without further ado, I'm turning over the microphone to her. I already know all the things I did wrong. I'll find out some more. The validation of rights. Why rights are right. I'm in the realm now of political philosophy, and rights tie in ethics to politics. Rights are moral principles defining and sanctioning man's freedom of action in a social context. What does that mean to me? Well, if I were to simplify that for me, it would be how to act, how I would live with other men, the right way to live with other men. So now I have to think, hmm, life. What is life? In order to live, or life, it's self-sustaining, self-generating action. I think the operative word is self for me, self, what I have to choose, what I have to decide for myself. I'm going to give some examples of that. Uh, the example that first came to my mind was abortion. Do I have the right to choose for myself what I want to do with my body? Does society or anyone, government or anyone, have the right to tell me what I must do. Another one is gun control, guns. Do I have the right to bear arms? Do I have the right to have a gun without getting fingerprinted, without having to register that with anyone? Do I have the right to protect myself? Uh, to follow that up, it's the new example of children being uh, fingerprinted uh, now, and the government saying the reason why they're doing that is to protect those children and their parents uh, so that they can find them if they're lost. That's the reasoning behind that, protection. And then the third example is when government intervenes in businesses. I'll use the airlines, the uh, decontrol of the airlines or the control of the airlines, and the difference later on when it was decontrolled. I'll tie those in in a moment, but I want to discuss the source of rights. Where does it come from? And it comes from the law of identity. A is A. Man is man. In order to live, I have to use my mind. I have to act on my free judgment. I have to make choices for myself. And in order to live, I have to work so that I can get the values that I want and keep those values. Now, in the case of all three uh, examples of choice and protection and being able to work, I'm lost. <laughs> uh, Dr. Peacock said, when you're lost, say you're lost, because I'm thinking. Okay, I have to get myself back here. Myself a moment. All right, let me go back to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are 
in the con that's in the Constitution, and that's basic rights. Hmm. The right to my life means that I have a right to freedom and the right to pursue what I want. So we'll take it back to work. In a country like Russia or China, you're told what kind of work you will do. You have no choice. You have no right to do what will make you happy, that which will let you live and pursue your life. In the case of uh, an abortion, you don't have a right to your own life. You're now told that you have another life to look after, that you must do that. It, it stops you economically from working. You now cannot achieve uh, certain values that you wanted to achieve. And in the case of businesses where government tells you that you must have certain controls, that you have to charge certain prices, again, you're not allowed to work. You're not allowed to gain, uh, produce, and to keep what you produce. One thing that I haven't brought up, which is very important, is the only way to protect individual rights is in a capitalist society. The government was set up only to protect us against physical force. They're not there to dictate to man what is right and what is wrong. Individual rights means subordinating society to moral law, that moral law comes first. Society doesn't tell us what is right or what is wrong. The right to support your life by your own work does not mean that others must give you a job, must support you. Uh, you have the right to pursue your values and to work for yourself. A man, we do not have to give a man a job, give a man a home. That's not uh, a part of, of uh, producing productivity. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that there are no other rights. There aren't economic rights. There aren't any other rights but individual rights. Those are the important, the only rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. Um, I'll just get my. So, what um, comments do I have on that? Now, there were again some virtues and some flaws. That was more definitely a certain type of presentation, right? What type of presentation in a broad way was that? Well, I'll give you just this much of a hint. <laughs> what? No, it was not rationalist. It was not rationalist by virtue of two definite features. What are the two features that were opposite of rationalism? So I didn't get one real rationalist today, <laughs> which is uh, either a testament to the success of the course or it's. <laughs> It's too bad, because there's going to be a whole lecture pretty soon on it. Um, this is the, was, in a way, the opposite of rationalism. Yes? Well, it was, it was empiricism. This is a much more empiricist presentation. Why? What were the features that made this empiricist? Two outstanding features. Well, it lacked structure. And it was really yeah, the structure was not, uh, it, it was not well structured. Now, I'm not, that's not a criticism. You know, I mean, you have to do what, what you understand. But I'll just show you uh, on some points how you could organize your thinking a little better. You started off, well, just to take the other point, what was the other point that was obviously not rationalistic? Concrete. Tremendous number of concretes, too many concretes, more than we could deal with it, outweighed the abstractions, uh, uh, which is also an empiricist uh, thing. We'll get to that. 
But let me give you one example of a lack of structure. You started by giving a definition. You said rights are uh, what? The moral principles sanctioning independent action. You rattled that off. And then you said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, it means um, how should I act in relation to others? Which you said you were just going to blurt out your simple understanding. But unfortunately, having put it that way, it made the issue of rights synonymous with any question of social ethics. How, how should you behave in dealing with others? So should you tell the truth to them? You know, should you be just to them? All of which are questions of ethics, not of politics, and not of the topic, would come under that. So you left it pretty vague. And that was my first sign that this is not a rationalist presentation, because a rationalist sits on the definition lovingly and elaborates it, because <laughs> his whole thing is then to extract his conclusion from it. And you kind of gave it a perfunctory thing. You went through the whole discussion, and at the end you said, much later. Now I have to make clear what I mean by rights. They don't mean rights to uh, economic uh, handouts and so on. They mean rights to action, which if you were going in a systematic way, since that was your original definition, sanction of independent action, you would have clarified right there. What do I mean by rights and what don't I? You see what I mean? So that was the tip off. This is definitely not a rationalist presentation. That's an example of lack of structure. Instead of trying to get the conclusion clear first, and then going on, you said something, you went on, you got lost, and you threw in a little more about what you mean by that conclusion. See what I mean? That's an example of lack of structure. What other lack of structure? Structure. Now, a proper structure, what is the first thing you do after you say what you're talking about, what your conclusion means? The first thing you do. You set the context. Now, you did include the context, but where? At what point? First of all, you went into a number of examples, right? So when we approached those examples, all we had in our mind was a general definition of rights that wasn't really too clear. And now we rushed right into examples. We had no real way of knowing. What are we supposed to be taking for granted? You, your own mind, had no way of knowing. See, you didn't separate the thing into two parts. The context that I'm taking for granted. This is not my assignment today. This is what I'm counting on. Versus, this is now what I'm focusing on. You see, and that's why, when you plunged right in with examples, and then you said, "Well, life requires that we use our mind and make choices and work." And then you stopped dead and you, you got lost. And the reason you got lost is perfectly logical, unavoidable, because since you hadn't said what you're taking, you know, what you're taking for granted, your mind was confronted with these big generalities. We have to live by the mind and work and etc. And you knew those are not self-containedly clear. So one part of you would be, well, let's start thinking about why do you have to use the mind, and why do you have to make choices, and why do you have to work. And on the other hand, your mind said, I'm supposed to be doing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not this other stuff. So what? You just stopped dead, you see. And the reason is you did not create your division of labor. The chewing has to be very, very uniquely focused on one topic. You, if you're going to focus on rights, you have to say before you get there. I am not going to discuss the following. So and so and so and so. I'm taking this much for granted. If you don't understand this, that's a different topic. But for now, I'm saying, assuming, and you gave us the perfect, the perfect lead into it, because you said, this is political philosophy. Now, I thought when you said that, that is the best thing you could say. I mean, I thought, you know, you're just going to go now off into the right statement of the context because, in other words, we're taking for granted the totality of ethics. Right? We're already taken for granted. And the whole of ethics tells us what? How a man should live. What principles he has to follow in order to live. And we're taking all of that for granted. Right? So this should be really a breeze thing. By the time we turn to this topic, we already know everything about how a man should live. Right? We're just making an obvious application of all the stuff we already know. We already know by this point 
life is the standard, and rationality is the means of achieving it, and every man should live for his own uh, self-interest, and he should live by principles, and he should be honest and independent, and he, et cetera, et cetera. And he has to be productive. The whole business of ethics is already taken for granted. We've already proved, presumably, in ethics that if we violate any of this, that's anti-life and that makes it impossible for us to survive. Well, once we know all that, it becomes relatively a snap. It's like a little tiny application to go to this topic, as I'll show you in a moment. But you did not, you said this is politics, only you didn't really live up to that because you said this is politics and partway through you said to yourself, gee, there's a lot of ethical points here that I'm not too clear about. Once you thought that, you should have said goodbye to politics. This is useless to talk about rights, and if I don't really get this, I'm not going to waste my time on politics. Why? It comes much later, you know, and you should have said, I'm going to change my assignment to hell with rights. Let's discuss so and so or whatever. See what I mean? Do you see why your mind would necessarily, by the way you approach it, have to stop? Because you're trying to understand, but you do not delimit what you're trying to understand. And therefore, as soon as you come to something, I mean, Every one of us could learn more about any broad principle. That's what chewing and the spiral consists of. So if you don't delimit the assignment, as soon as you say one of these generalities about life requires work, and if your only assignment is I must understand, your mind thinks, well, I've got to understand then, why does it require work? I, you know, I can't remember and dredge up work. What is work? It's achieving values, and choices. And then you think, what am I doing? I'm, I'm getting, getting nowhere near life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, so I've got to drop that, but you feel dissatisfied and confused, and then it becomes chaos, see? So this is like the best I can do to dramatize for you why you have to set a context and then say, I will not discuss this context in this thought process. If I'm not clear about it, I'm going to avowedly change the thought process. Now that's what I call an example of a structured thinking. You see. What am I trying to show? What am I counting on that I will not think about now? And now, what is my specific topic? But you didn't do that, you see. You just sort of just jumped around, and that's an example of a lack of structure in a, a number of different ways. Now let's take the issue of um, your examples. You gave us a lot of examples. And that's good. We want a lot of examples. But your examples, unfortunately, I do not think were uh, ideally chosen. By reference to a point that I made in the first part. You picked interesting examples but what is the one problem with these examples from the aspect of what we are trying to do? These are just examples on the same order as Freddie's example of Israel. They are controversial, complicated, difficult. Uh, for instance, if you say about abortion, how can the government or whichever tell me what to do with my body? That by itself is not really very convincing. Because I had somebody, a, a very famous libertarian, who I won't dignify by mentioning his name, <laughs> say to me once uh, um, that he believes in absolute liberty, and if something is his typewriter, he should be able to throw it at another person. How can the government say what I should do with my property? If it's my typewriter, I can drop it on somebody else's head. Now. I mean, you can't, you, you see what I mean? So just to say I can do what I want with my own body is not true. You can do what you want with your own body if your body stays out of the way of other bodies. <laughs> but then that raises the question that the abortionists, uh, the anti-abortionists bring out, but it's murder. This little uh, embryo or whichever is another human being, you can't use your body to kill. Now of course that's wrong, and I trust I don't have to explain why. But it nevertheless is a co complication. It's not a clear-cut self-evidency, but that's what you want in examples when you're trying to understand. Gun control is also a very complicated issue. 
Because after all, guns are lethal weapons. The government does have a right to restrict force in a society. That's its essential function. And therefore, it's a very debatable issue what kind of guns. You couldn't have an H-bomb in your front yard and say, well, it's my yard. Well, who, <laughs> who is going to draw the line at exactly what point and say, well, you can, have, you can have a pistol, but you can't have a submachine gun or what? I mean, those are really tricky questions. I myself would be hard put to give an eloquent speech on the issue of gun control. That doesn't mean that I necessarily agree with the liberals. I'm saying simply, that is a complex issue. And my first instinct would be, if I'm trying to understand the basic philosophy of rights, I would leap out the window rather than think of gun control. <laughs> you see, Because I have to first understand the issue of rights thoroughly, and then I would have to untangle all the complexities in that particular concrete. You see, So for rights, I would want straightforward things like slavery, you know, or you know, robbery, or murder, you know, outright things like that. The draft is okay. At that to me, that's not too controversial. I mean, it's it's clear what the person is doing, what the government is doing. But I would want the kind of examples which are naked, un unconfusing. Then, after I understood that, I would go to the interesting, complex applications. So you had a lot of concretes, but they were often controversial concretes. And the question is, the, the, the other problem with the concretes is they weren't really connected clearly to a principle. Now, a concretes with, which don't illustrate a principle are correspondingly not of that much use, because the whole idea is the union, the principle with the concretes. Otherwise, there's nothing to tie them together, enable you to hold them, enable you to see why these concretes are important or what the, what the issue is. Now, the closest you get is to say the source of rights is the law of identity. Man has to live a certain way, and rights are that way. Well, that's true. But that is a little generalized, don't you think? You could give us one step more of breaking down why you have to have certain rights and how that relates to what we've already established in ethics. It's just too general to say, man has to live a certain way, rights are that way. How are they that way? Not just con concrete examples, but in principle. It's the same issue that we were asking with regard to force. The actual theory, what is the connection between the ethical principles of how man should live and the topic of rights. What is the principle of the connection, you see? That you never really get. I mean, you hinted at it. You suggested it. You said things which, if I you know, played the Socratic interrogator and kept asking, I would finally elicit it from you. But as stated, it was uh, uh, fragmentary. You'll forgive me for pointing out several problems in the presentation. No, but you did do good things. You, the, the desire for examples was good. The uh, statement that this is political philosophy was excellent. You got a, a, the right definition right at the beginning, e even if it had to be elaborated further. You tried to tie it into actual situations, so there was, there was definitely many good things here. But it was basically um, not uh, uh, as orderly and as abstractly connected as uh, we could have asked. The other thing that, just one other uh, problem I wanted to point out here, and that is, in one respect, you violated the principle of the hierarchical structure. Because what topic did you bring in as very important, which shouldn't be in this discussion? Because it comes later. Yes? Government. government and capitalism. Government, according to objectivism, is the agency which protects rights. So we don't discuss government until we have rights in the picture. So in, in validating rights, you can't say, we know this is what the government is supposed to do. You're anti-hierarchical, then you're using something later to establish this. And capitalism is way down the line. When we get to capitalism, we validate it by saying, this is the system in which the government performs the right functions. 
which is protecting rights. So capitalism comes way down the line yet. You see, capitalism is the end of politics, basically. We're at the beginning of politics, you see. So you had an anti-hierarchical uh, uh, element. Now, let me try in about five minutes just to indicate to you a few things about how I would approach uh, the issue of rights. Well, I would begin by stating the context. This is politics. It's the first issue of politics. This is the beginning of politics, the way life is the standard is the beginning of ethics. And the question is, what should be the relation of the individual to society? Are there any immunities, any prerogatives that other people, society, have to respect or not? Is there any limit to what it can do to the individual or not? This is before we get to the discussion of government. Now, let's stop and ask right here, why is this whole question necessary of rights? What will be wrong? Because just because people talk about an issue doesn't mean the issue is worth discussing. What would be wrong with the following? Let's just get rid of rights altogether. The whole topic is otios. Why not just say, we've already established in the first half that the initiation of force is evil. Therefore the government should bar it because it's immoral, and that's it. So the government should prohibit robbery, etc. It shouldn't initiate force. We've already established that force is evil. That's it. So who needs all this life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and rights? Now, if you could do that, then this is, this is inessential. It's unnecessary. It's just a big com complication. We should just go from the evil of force to government bars force because it's immoral, and that's it. Now, these are the type of questions you should ask if you're trying to understand. If it's not really clear to you why is something an issue, you should ask, well, let's get rid of it and see where we would be then. Does it really answer something? Is it an important question, or can I get along without it? Does it raise some new aspect? Now, in fact, you could not go just from force is evil, therefore the government should ban it. Because there's all kinds of evils. The fact that something is evil or immoral does not mean automatically that the government should ban it. If that were your argument, the implication would be the government is the upholder of morality. Anything that we've established as immoral, the government should stop. It should prevent people from being dishonest, from being compromisers, from being unjust, etc., etc. Well, that would be totalitarianism, in effect. Now, then you would think to yourself, well, maybe I have to modify and say, the government should prevent immoralities only if they affect others. But obviously that is insufficient. In some sense, every immorality, quote, affects others. If you lie to a friend, you affect him. If you're unjust to an employee, you affect him, etc., etc. But those don't belong to the government. Why? Well, you say, there's a lot of things that people can do that are bad. That's not what we're talking about. There's a lot of things that people can do that are bad and affect others. That's not what we're talking about. We're asking one specific question. Is there an absolute minimum necessary if society is to be possible? Are there some conditions of which this society has to be organized if it's to function at all? Are there some things without which human beings cannot live together? Is there some principle that we can say, if we're going to cohabit this, is that the right word? Coexist. If we're going to coexist, we must obey certain things. There are certain things society cannot do. That's exactly the topic of rights. What, if any, are those things? So it is a necessary topic. It is a necessary issue when you get to uh, politics. You cannot simply say the government should prohibit whatever is immoral. Now, basically, I agree with the analysis of what rights are. I think that's covered in the literature, so I won't go into that further. What I want to do is indicate briefly how rights are derived from morality. The, the essential abstract argument. 
because it's really very straightforward. Rights take for granted the whole of ethics, and the principle relating ethics to politics is simply this. What is moral in ethics must be possible in politics. The way of life that we define in ethics as the good, as that which man's life requires, must be possible to live in society. Therefore, all we have to know is what is that way, and how could others prevent it? And then we'll be able to read off right away. Those are the things they can't do. These are the things you have a right to. In other words, society has to institutionalize the conditions that enable man to follow morality. And then from there, you just read it off. You look back to the ethics, and you say, in morality we tell each man, the fundamental goal is life. Act so as to sustain your life. Your need to act a certain way is what creates values to begin with. Therefore, you must always act in such a way as to sustain your life. Well, when we come to politics, what do we say? The fundamental principle has to be you act in such a way as to sustain your life. If other people interfere, they are violating the crucial condition of uh, human existence and coexistence. The fundamental value in ethics is life, and the fundamental right is the right to life. In morality, we say you can only achieve your life by using your mind, your reason, etc., and acting accordingly. What does that come out to in politics? Liberty, the right to act according to your judgment. So liberty is simply the sum of those virtues, rationality, independence, integrity, thinking, thinking by your own mind, acting accordingly, and saying in society no one can prevent you from doing that. Not if life is our goal, and our purpose is to have a society in which you can practice the principles of human survival. Ethics tells us productiveness is a central virtue. Politics tells us keep what you've produced and use it to sustain yourself. That's the right to property. Ethics tells us pursue your own well-being, egoism. Politics tells us right to the pursuit of happiness. Now you see these are all one issue. Ethics is simply life is the standard and all it requires. Politics is simply to achieve life in an organized group. This is what they must leave you alone in. These are the areas they cannot touch. They have to let you do the basic things that human survival uh, requires. So what then is the context of rights? Well, I would say the totality of ethics, but the way I would keep it in my mind is four words. Life, rationality, productiveness, egoism. Now I picked those four because I want to get to four rights. But those are the four issues of ethics which are the context after which you can simply rattle off the conclusion in politics. So this is really easy if you really keep in mind the context. Now, of course, if you're not clear on the need of rationality or productiveness or egoism or whichever, then of course you will stick all together in politics. But assuming a division of labor, there is no problem. Uh, is this inductive or deductive? Because in a way all I'm doing is deducing from the principles of ethics how they have to apply in society. So at least it looks like deduction, right? Only what? Yeah. Sir, <laughs> you could not have reached those principles without observing 
many things in reality, including governments around the world. You could not have reached the issue of rights if you didn't observe specifically the whole history of man, the correlation between standard of living, progress, etc., and freedom, on the one hand, versus stagnation and so on, with slavery or violation of rights. You couldn't do it just by deduction from rationality. So again, it's what we saw with regard to force. You have to observe a tremendous amount of history, concrete facts, to reach the conclusion on an inductive level. A certain type of government facilitates human life and a certain doesn't, contradicts it. And then you say, now what do I know about man and the mind, etc., that would explain this? And you tie that into what you have established, you integrated, you see, to your knowledge of the need of the mind and productiveness, etc. At that point, it is deductive, you see. So like all philosophy, it's inductive to get the essential material, and then deductive as organized and presented as, a, as an argument. And the flaw of people is to come in only at the presentation, without all the earlier observation, and think that all you do is churn out conclusions from, a, um, from some definition. Now, I want to ask one last question, and then we will uh, leave this topic. Uh, well, maybe I'll, or oh, just for the heck of it. This is a question, I can see you have that glazed look that we've covered too much material. But it's just a question of hierarchical order as a kind of anticipation of what we're going to be focusing on next week. If you had to take three topics only and arrange them hierarchically, the issue of force, the issue of rights, the issue of government, what order would you put them in? Now obviously government has to come after rights, because government, that'll be the last. But would you say force, rights, government, or rights, force, government? In other words, developing this topic structurally, I'm trying now to relate all the things we did tonight, in an overall development of philosophy, which comes first, force, the evil of force, or the validity of rights? All right, I'd like to see by a show of hands. This is not a question we're going to settle by vote. But out of curiosity, how many say rights come before the evil of force? Looks to me something near half. And how many say force come before rights? That seems to be a little over half. Well, I'm happy to be in the majority on this question. I think you can definitely prove that force precedes rights. That the evil of force precedes the validation of individual rights. And I'm going to give you that just as an example of hierarchical reasoning. And then you apply it to the rest of the stuff for homework. Can you take this one last point? <laughs> force, the evil of force, is part of morality. It's a basic principle of how to live. It would hold true even apart from any organized society. If there was just you and one other guy on a desert island, the evil of force would apply. Remember, our whole standard is man's life. And that means man's life qua man, as against qua animal, in other words, qua thinker rather than qua forcer. The evil of force, in other words, is built into the essential defining what is the proper way of life. Then you get to rights when you reach politics. You say, all right, now I know all this. How should society be organized? And then you work out the various rights. 
And then you see the only method of violating these rights is by the use of force. Now what principle is obviously applying here? The spiral, correct. The basic principle is now appearing in a political context, and you're now seeing a further confirmation. Just as this evil of force is part of the essence of ethics, so now it's the fact that force is the antonym of rights, and that's the thing the government has to, has to wipe out, simply confirms further how force is anti-light. If you do it in reverse, if you argued rights come first and then force is simply their consequence, the e force is evil because it violates rights, it would imply that force is evil only on political grounds. In other words, that force violates the proper social arrangements. So that would be the implication of the argument. It would amount to saying force is wrong only because it violates the right structure of society. And yet the actual evil of force is much deeper than that. The evil of force is that it violates the essential requirements of man's mind and the very essence of his method of survival, you see. That is more basic. It's like a metaphysical issue pertaining to man's nature and his relation to reality. It's more basic than the details of how society should be organized, and rights in that respect are a detail. A crucial detail, but from the perspective we're here talking about, a later application. Now, I, I don't want to hammer this point to death because actually, in reality, everything is simultaneous. So I'm not making a huge fuss about this, but it is true that your thinking will be helped if you keep clear what comes before what, what is a fundamental, and what is an application. Uh, and that is your essential assignment for next time. All right. Let's stop here. In a couple of minutes, we'll have questions. Thank you. All right, I'm going to turn to questions now. Again, I have a torrent of questions. I'm going to try next week to have a longer question period and a shorter uh, class to try to catch up. So if I don't get to yours this week, it doesn't mean I don't think it was good, but I'm just completely snowed under here. And they're all very interesting uh, questions, too, so I'm going to try to rattle off some anyway. And here are two that are basically the same. <coughs> In regard to the first presentation, wouldn't it have been better if he had said consciousness is volitional rather than consciousness rationality is not automatic? Thus he would, I think, have made it easier to see that force is anti-volitional and therefore anti-consciousness and therefore anti-life. And another one, I'm sure there's others in there that say it, but these are the only ones I got to. In discussing the topic of force, isn't free will a necessary part of the context? Your explanation stressed that the mind does not work by force. Isn't volition a good one-word summary of this? Shouldn't this have already been chewed before a chewing of the evil of force? So these are two different forms of asking, what about free will as a necessary element in the context of the evil of force, and did we omit that? That's an interesting question. My answer to that would be, in one sense, of course, free will is a prerequisite, prerequisite, not only of the topic of force, but of all ethical questions, because there can be no advice as to how to value, if we have no choice, and of all conclusions, period, because there's no question of should we use reason or whatever if we have no choice. Uh, free will is an, I'm giving away a little secret from next week, but free will is an axiom of epistemology, 
And as such, it presuppose it's it's required to get anywhere after you say a few metaphysical axioms. It's way down at the bottom of the story in that sense, absolutely. But the questioners here imply: isn't free will something that you should narrowly and specifically focus on as I as a direct um, tie-in to force. Isn't it something you have to focus on in order to really understand force, the evil of force? I don't think so. For instance, take this person who said, shouldn't the argument be in effect force is anti-volitional and therefore anti-consciousness and therefore anti-life? If that's the way it stands in your mind, I'm not sure that that represents understanding. It's true, but it's tremendously abstract. Because the thought in my mind would be, what if someone would force you and say, I'm not touching your free will. Your free will is between you and your own mind. According to objectivism, free will is a choice to think or not to think. So you sit there in your own mind and decide. You can evade, you can focus, I don't care what you do, I'm just saying I'm going to control your body. Now, how am I interfering with your free will? See what I mean? And if uh, you cannot, in other words, equivocate on the word free, you can't say, well, the opposite of force is being free, and, the, uh, and free will is important, so free will leads to non force. I had a student once um, at one of these New York uh, City colleges who said that free will was guaranteed by the American Constitution. Whereas in Russia they had only determinism. <laughs> now that is ridiculous. Free will is the one question of basic nature of the mind, and the other is an issue of what the government uh, uh, should do. You cannot go simply from one right to the other. But now, when this person said, what, when you say, the mind doesn't work by force. Isn't volition a good one-word summary of this? I would answer to that specific question. If you understand that, fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with saying the mind doesn't work by force because its essence is the choice to focus or not. And if it doesn't make that the certain choice and see the facts, etc., on its own, it can't be forced. In other words, if you bring in to the discussion of the impossibility of forcing a mind, the fact that it is volitional and has to be controlled and regulated by the owner, the mind itself, terrific. I would not fault that. It gives you an even fuller uh, focus uh, on it. That's helpful. But my principle is Occam's razor. You know, entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. When I want to understand at the beginning, I try to strip to the bare minimum, the absolute minimum required of the context to get to this point. And from that point of view, I could imply free will, but I don't have to focus on that so long as I focus simply on the fact you cannot do it. The mind is a cognitive faculty. It operates a certain way. I don't have to go all the way to the root of that and open up a whole kettle of worms about what exactly do I mean by free choice, etc., in order to grasp this one issue of force. Of course, to grasp everything about the issue of force, I do. But that's the whole idea of chewing, is to restrict your range. So I would never say that's wrong. If you understand free will that clearly, that to you volition means a certain way the mind must operate, and therefore you can't force it? Terrific. That's a better integration still than the way I suggested. But I tried to indicate to you why I strip it down as much as possible uh, in trying to understand. Could you please distinguish between hierarchy and stages as you mean these concepts in items two and six of your checklist? Yes. Hierarchy, as I use it, refers exclusively to setting the context. It means that the items in the context must be set in logical order and can include no items too late that come after the thing you're trying to prove. Stages applies to the 
argument that you are giving in proving the particular topic at issue, for instance, if you are proving life as the standard, you analyze the nature of life, you analyze the nature of values, then you put the two together. If you're establishing force, you analyze the nature of mind and what it can accomplish, you analyze what the forcer then has to do, etc. In other words, you simply break up your argument into point one, point two, point three. So it depends, every example of understanding should be a brief recitation of a context and then a step-by-step -step chewing of one argument, and then all the concretized they can integrate. So hierarchy refers to the context and stages to the argument. I hope that makes it clear. Now I have, I still have a lot of questions on honesty from last time, but um, I want to do a couple more that, that got in under the wire on force, because these two are basically the same. Um, all of the examples given of the use of force involved either taking a person's values against his will or forcing him to act in a certain way against his will in order to gain some undeserved value. What is not explicitly covered is the equally coercive action of forcing a person to take an action that you believe to be good for the victim. For example, giving someone a blood transfusion against his will. What about this? And then another question which says essentially the same, regarding force, is the argument that one uh, should at times force a person to act a certain way for their own good the same issue as what was covered in the presentations? Would a complete argument on the evil of force cover such devil's advocate questions, for example, why not ban heroin, as part of the concretization of this issue? Now that's a good question. Well, let's take the second one first. Would a complete argument on the evil of force cover such a question? Definitely. Why? Because it's a very widespread confusion, which might be confusing to you too. Not just to the devil playing the devil's advocate, but it might stand in your mind, well, I understand force to destroy the life, but what about force to preserve life? You see? And therefore, on the face of it, that would co definitely come in at some point. But the person asks, is this the same issue as what was covered in the presentation? What's the answer to that? What is the answer? Since I don't like no as an answer. <laughs> yes, it is the same issue. It's the same issue insofar as what? Yes. But of what issue? It's still the same issue. What's the issue? Yes. Can't hear you. In other words, of the principle that man survives a certain way and force is antithetical to that principle, and that therefore it is evil in principle. It is just as true in this case as in all the other cases, that you are paralyzing the mind of the individual to the extent of the initiation of force, even if in any particular concrete case the particular thing you give him helps him. You are still initiating a principle which is at variance with the requirements of his long-range principled survival. If you initiate the idea, I can initiate force when I choose so long as, and I can, you know, violate his mind, his conclusions, and his judgment, so long as, in my opinion, this is for uh, the long-range welfare of the person, there is, that is the end of being opposed to uh, force, because there is no way in which you could prevent that same pretext from being used for anything. Mass robbery on the grounds that people have to learn to live in difficult conditions, that's what the ecologists are saying. They're doing that for your own welfare, for your own benefit. They burned them at the stake in the Inquisition for the benefit of the victims so the soul could go to the next dimension, That's, you know, and so on. So once you're going to inject my opinion of what's good for his life as a separate issue, aside from what it does to his mind, that's it. 
you've wiped out the principle. So I would say the same principle is included, it, it, it applies. We have, in fact, covered it. It's worth including and even chewing a particular example. Take state medicine, for instance. I'm not going to do it now in my fleeting question period, but take a few cases where they actually mandate you know, certain health requirements and so on, uh, which are, quote, beneficial, and see what that principle of functioning has to do. You will end up you know, with something like Britain, and you see what that's, uh, to, to say nothing of other countries. You'd have to chew in detail. But the point is, all you would be doing is chewing the same principle, that force is antithetical to mind. Why didn't I include that here? For the same reason that I didn't include abortion in the discussion of rights or Israel in the discussion of force. Why? Too much complexity. Too many steps that you have to go through. First, we're trying to grasp the basic principle clearly. Let that sit in your mind, you know? And then later, you can add more complexities onto it. It's like baking a cake. You put it in the oven, you let it rise, you take it out, you let it cool, and a week or two later, you come and put another layer <laughs> on it. You don't wait the instant it's in the refrigerator and drop you know, uh, uh, an apple smack in the center of it and let it just collapse, which is what would happen if you try to inject these more complex issues into uh, your basic understanding. So I sympathize with the desire to include, but after all, this is just a pretext. In fact, you can't help somebody by using force. You can keep them alive a bit longer at the price of encouraging him to be still more irrational and letting him escape some of the consequences of his irrationality, but you cannot, in principle, help him. Uh, you can't help life by destroying its means, and therefore, this is just a trickier example of the same standard stuff, and why confuse yourself with it when you're trying to understand the standard, which is going to be your means of answering it, you see. So make a division in your mind. First, the essentials, then the tricky stuff that you need uh, to answer people. Now, um, there's several questions with which I sympathize asking me to review points already covered, but unfortunately, I just can't answer those because I'd have to just give the whole thing again. So I sympathize, but I just don't have the time. I do want to take a couple on honesty here. Because you've had a week to let honesty cool now, so it should be OK. I would never take this one last week, but this week is OK. I sell to a buyer at a major mass merchandiser who seems to benefit from dishonesty. When I tried to break into this account, he made an unreasonable demand and insisted he had to have it. The demand was unreasonable, and I made a counteroffer, fully expecting it to be rejected. He accepted the counteroffer. In a sense, he is bluffing. If his bluff isn't called, he benefits. Of course, I always suspect he may be bluffing based on experience. Doesn't this show dishonesty can pay off? Now, that's a perfectly valid, because the idea is supposed to be to show. We stated in principle, honesty is practical, etc. And here's a guy presumably lying through his teeth. Uh, I've got to have such and such a price or whatever. Uh, and he makes more money by saying that than he would otherwise, so dishonesty is paying off. Now, a certain amount of this is okay. I would not suggest doing 500 examples like this, but once in a while to liven things up. Okay, who wants to take on this one? Is this a proof that honesty is a dishonesty is practical? You don't get the example. Well, the example is supposed to be the guy lied. He said, I have to have this price, when he knew he would come down to a lesser price. And sometimes he takes the person in, and he actually makes a higher price by that. Therefore, in the long run, by saying, I must have this price, even though, in fact, he doesn't have to have that price, he makes more money than he otherwise would. In other words, upping the ante in a bargaining situation when you know 
they're going to come down if you're pushed is practical, which it is in many cases, and therefore that's an example of dishonesty, working. Now, the main problem with this example is what? It's not dishonest, not in the sense that we are talking about. This is New York bargaining. <laughs> and in most contexts, it's understood. If uh, it happened at Bloomingdale's, you wouldn't say it's dishonest if the sales lady says this thing is. 78.50 and it's really 42 and she pockets the difference, that is definitely dishonesty, but that is not practical. But, and there's no context where you expect to bargain, but in many places there are contexts. And the whole idea of bargaining is to get as much as you can. And the implication of that is you start by saying, I want such and such. Uh, and you can state that with various degrees of vociferousness. <laughs> now, that is bluffing, but that's understood in the context. If a person came out and started this negotiation and said, I want $25, but I'll take 12, he's finished right then. <laughs> so the understood context is, I really want this, I insist on having this, but since I'm arguing anyway, who knows, maybe you can get me down if you fight me. I mean, and that then proceeds to be what you're doing. But I would go farther than to say this. Suppose by some incredible degree of bluffing and, and uh, insisting that he'll take only a certain price that was in fact above what a market price would be, he kept making more money. And would that show that that's the best way to conduct your business in the long run? It would not even there because all that's going to happen is to get a reputation for selling above the market price. And therefore, in the long run, it's simply going to harm his business. So the, it is not the dishonesty or the quote, even the bluffing that pays off. The actual thing that he is succeeding on is having merchandise worth a certain amount. The bargaining is simply to break down what is that amount. And that is not the same thing as dishonesty. Another one, can we take one more on dishonesty? I got a job by lying about my birthplace. I did not want the interviewer to consider it as my qualification. I did not lie about my education or experience. I think it would have been irrational for him to consider it, that is my birthplace. Was I dishonest in the sense prohibited by morality? No, I don't think so. I do not um, think so, unless you were born, for instance, in a leper colony then I think you are definitely obtaining the job by fraud. But the whole thing here is extremely complicated by the fact of living in a mixed economy, where a tremendous number of opportunities are closed to all of us because of governmental uh, force. And the questions I would say that a person has a right to ask you in a laissez-faire society are not the same as the questions where things are so rigged by government controls. If there were 10 million jobs, which there would be in a free society, and one employer was irrational enough to want to know, you know, well, were you born in Ohio or Indiana or whichever, if it's completely irrelevant, that's one thing. I would say, okay, tell the guy the truth, but what's the difference to you? But if a field is so closed and constricted, in general or in particular, by a whole bunch of control, that you are at the mercy of somebody's irrationality, you have a right to defend yourself. I would say, for instance, this is obviously applicable in filling out questionnaires about rents, about renting a place in New York City where there is rent control, with the result that there is no rental housing and you're absolutely out on the street uh, unless you bribe people and you know, get the imprimatur from seven different superintendents, etc. Now, uh, this ridiculous idea, for instance, that um, you have to be married uh, in order to live with someone in your apartment, uh, and you can't do it if you're single. Now, under free rental housing, if we had an ample supply the way it would be under a free country, if a guy only wanted married couples, good luck to him. 
He could do it, and he would have a right to it. But the way the situation is today, a, the tenant is a complete victim. So are the landlords, of course. They're at each other's throat by the nature of the setup, but you still have to survive. And if some landlord is going to keep you out of a place in which you would be a perfectly reputable, quiet, responsible tenant because he has an absurd prejudice against two people living together who aren't married, you have no, you do not owe him uh, telling him uh, your life story. It would be as if he gives you a questionnaire and says, fill out your sexual proclivities. If you engage in oral relationships, you're out. I mean, what's in his business? Uh, and therefore, I would say you are entirely entitled uh, not to tell the truth in cases of that kind. Now, I'm not advocating carte blanche lying, but there are many, many impositions on people today caused by the semi-bureaucracy that exists. You know, for instance, the arch example, which I thoroughly approve of, is the, is the now since I said approve, I'll have to put it the following way. I disapprove of these massive projective test questionnaires that employment aid, uh, uh, personnel offices give to hire people in huge corporations. You know, with all these projective test questions that you're supposed to answer, being judged by some incredible psychologist uh, somewhere, fresh out of rat laboratories. <laughs> and uh, there are books, you know, that advise you how to answer these dishonestly so as to become employed. And I strongly uh, approve of any form of dishonesty on those questionnaires in order to get the job. It's complete BS. It's uh, moder motivated by modern bureaucracy and modern psychology. It's absolutely unjustified. Uh, and uh, any one of those projective test questions that you can make up anything on, you're entitled to. Now, you see, this is the kind of thing we, we could have, like two whole evenings just on. Well, once we know honesty in the simple, straightforward things, how do you apply it in this case, in this case, in this case? But there's only so much that we can do. But that'll give you an example. You see, I would never bring that up last week, though, because suppose I was trying to understand honesty. And partway through, and I'm still trying to grasp the basic thing, I think, well, to make it interesting, should I lie to my landlord? I would be wiped out. My mind would close down. I couldn't possibly hold such a thing. Uh, I'm afraid, I'm trying to see if there's anything that we can do. I don't see anything that I can do very briefly. I think I'll just have to quit here because all of these are complex and try to have a longer question period next time. Thank you very much.